Um, again, welcome to Application Insider Tips. My name is Sue Sacco, and I'm the Assistant Director of Admissions. And I'm joined here by my colleague, Melissa, who I'll let introduce herself. Yes, hi everyone. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. What a Zoom joy that still haven't figured this out so many years in. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Melissa Croft and I am Associate Director of Admissions for the Master's in Asset Management Program. And I'm super happy that you joined Sue and I today. Thanks, Melissa. And then we have one more colleague who will be in the chat throughout the session. So if anyone is currently in a location where they have to chat in questions, uh, please feel free to do so. Our colleague, Elena Heath, will be in the chat to help you out. So just a few housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, the beginning of this session will be uh, run by Melissa and I, so I will be covering recommendations. Melissa will be talking a little bit about essays, and then we will go into breakout rooms so that you all can ask any questions you have. Um, and let's just go ahead and get started. There we go. So. I wanted to put this up here just to give you a general overview of our application. You can read all our components of the application on your screen. Our application deadline is January 10th, and you will hear back from us March 26th. So just to give you a little bit of insight, um, the application is read by our admissions committee, which both Melissa and I are a part of. And another piece I think as admissions officers that we do that people don't often think about is um, evaluating our application. So year over year, we take a look at each component and think about what sort of information we're gleaning from it. So it's something that we spend a lot of time, put a lot of energy and are incredibly intentional when we're thinking about putting together our application, um, which is why we host sessions like this. And I always ask that you, you know, put in as much care and intention when you're filling out each section. And so today we will be focusing on two components, the letters of recommendation, and the essays, because I actually think that these are oftentimes overlooked and can be really beneficial when thinking about your application narrative as a whole. Um, and a little bit counterintuitive, but I do think you actually even have the most control over these two aspects. And I think that's a little counterintuitive with letters of recommendation, but let me just get into why. Um, so our letters of recommendation really serve as a place for us to get to know you um, and what you're like in a professional setting and an academic setting. So Who's, who's writing your recommendations? Like I said, one recommender should be an academic um, recommender. So someone who can assess your performance in a university setting, um, a professor, an academic mentor, someone within that vein. The other person should be a professional recommender. So again, this is an early career program. So we understand that you might not have full-time work experience. What we're looking for is someone who has supervised you within a um, applied work experience setting. So an internship, an extracurricular, a activity, excuse me, a long-term academic project. You can really kind of um, think about who would be best to represent your work experience here. Um, and so I want to get a little bit more into the technical aspects of um, your recommendation. So I have a little screenshot of where that is in the application. You will press, you will um, include your recommender's name and email, and then you will press a button that says send to recommender. From there, they will receive a link which will allow them to fill in their recommendation portal. Um, the recommendations are actually due to, uh, January 12th, so two days post application submission deadline. And something I hear often is, can I hit submit on my application before my recommenders submit their recommendation? And the answer to that is yes, absolutely. We just ask that you kind of stay on top of your recommender if you're not hearing back from our application system that they haven't submitted yet. And um, I always say, you know, give them the deadline that you have of the 10th and then say it's OK. Um, just please get it in by the 12th because it is really in your best interest that they get in their recommendation so we can start reviewing your application as soon as possible. So that is a little bit more on the technical side. I'm actually going to jump into 
more of my, um, what I would call pro tips, if you will, kind of the best way to get the most out of your recommendations. Uh, so something I often tell people is that you could be your own advocate. So going back to what I said earlier in terms of having control over your recommendations, um, this is a great place to kind of get in touch with your recommender and say, maybe let's, let's go out to coffee and let's talk about, you know, what I did in your class or what I did during that internship and what I'm doing now and kind of jog their memory as to, you know, what you accomplished during your time that they knew you, but also what you've been doing now. Um, that just kind of helps them to write a better um, recommendation, right? Because if they have a better sense of why you're applying to a master's in asset management, what sorts of things they should be highlighting, then that is what we're looking for, really. My only on the flip side of that is that um, sometimes we have folks who, you know, you might be asking someone who's incredibly busy and they say, hey, just write this recommendation and I'll sign it. Please, please, please do not do that. <laughs> we can tell when you've written your own recommendation and that obviously, even if you were told to do that, it does not reflect well on you in an application uh, process. So if someone says that, you know, please have that conversation with them. And if they are kind of adamant that that's how they do things, then please ask someone else. Because again, we just want to see you um, have the strongest application possible. Um, so Again, thinking about being intentional with these recommendations, when you're looking at your application as a whole, um, this is another place where you can really highlight some skills or maybe just bolster places that you might find um, that maybe is a little bit weak. So if you're worried about your quantitative preparation, for instance, um, maybe this is a good place to ask a statistics professor or a computer science professor, someone that can speak to that quantitative preparation. Um, if you're thinking to yourself, oh, well, you know, maybe I didn't have a statistics professor that I was super close to, but I did an internship where um, I built a lot of statistical models in R great, then use that. Um, but really just kind of think about what pieces of your application you either want to bolster a little bit or that you really want to highlight and help that inform how you're picking your recommenders. Um, and with that, always pick someone that knows you best over someone with a higher title. It might be really cool to have, you know, your C-suite execs know who you are, even though you spent eight weeks at a company like that is really impressive. And we totally get that. Um, but just from, you know, where we're sitting, we read a ton of recommendations. And I promise you, we can tell almost immediately how well someone knows you um, based on the way they talk about you. So again, that can be helped with the, um, the coffee chat, the email recap, those sorts of things. But I would so much rather hear from a supervisor who, you know, tells me a really awesome story about how you might have come in and been on the quieter side because you were learning, but then you just really wowed everyone. Um, and again, like those stories of failure are actually some of my personal favorites. If you kind of stumbled in a project and then really pulled it together in the last uh, couple of weeks, like that's a great recommendation that I would rather receive than someone who's a CIO and is like, oh, I heard great things about this person. Um, so please keep that in mind. And again, recommendations really do provide the color to the uh, previous pieces of the application, I would say. It's awesome to see a transcript where you're getting straight A's or you know, are clearly knocking it out of the ballpark with your GPA, but it's so much more um, additive when I get to read directly from a professor, like, you know, like this person is a rock star, they get A's all the time in their um, math classes. However, they also took time to tutor three students. And then that gives me a better sense of what you're like in an academic setting. And again, same goes for your work experience. If you're working on a research project with a professor, um, I much rather hear um, from their perspective how you approach them about this project, what you were thinking about. Did you learn Python in a semester because it ended up being what you needed to know um, in order to properly approach your research? Um, and, you know, again, there's 
so many great things that we glean from the resume, but it's really hard for me to determine what you optimizing a data process and an internship looks like versus hearing from your supervisor that they've been, you know, meaning to do that for 20 years. And this person actually came in and showed that initiative. So that's really where um, recommendations can help you out. Um, and then just some frequently asked questions, I would say, um, I kind of went over this, but choose a recommender that knows you, choose someone that will be, speak to your um, abilities best. And also, again, kind of on the flip side, um, don't choose a family friend or someone who knows you personally for these recommendations. They really are meant to be a reflection of your professional and academic um, prowess. So I just ask that, um, you know, you kind of keep to those parameters. Um, what if my recommender doesn't work for the same company anymore? This is something that we hear quite often. So a piece that I forgot to mention earlier is that recommenders, you should always use their institutional or company email address. So um, if they don't work for the same company in which you worked with them, absolutely okay. Um, they can fill out your recommendation with their current company or institution email address. Just please encourage them not to use a personal Gmail account. Um, this really holds up. And the reason for that is that it really kind of holds up your application process. We do just, uh, we vet all recommenders. So it makes it a little harder when we have personal emails. It's much easier for um, us to have those institutional email accounts. So just best practice always um, always just ask them to use their professional account. And then lastly, what do I do if my recommender doesn't get an email? This is another one. We all know that company firewalls and academic institutions have some pretty intense security. So I would say first line of defense, ask them to check spam, right? That's something that we are all used to doing when we don't get an email. Um, if they, it's still not there and they're like, hey, listen, it really isn't there reach out to us and I will put up our um, our application email address, but that's something that we can go in on our end and just make sure that they are receiving, we can update it. So just again, one of my other just best tips is make sure you're in touch with us because we can help you as long as we know what's going on. Um, and please just be mindful of timing because if it's January 9th at midnight, I might not be checking my email at that point. So just give me a heads up if you're like, hey, I've reached out to my recommender three times, haven't heard back, but I know they're working on it. And maybe they're at a research conference in Japan and can't. Um, so again, stay in touch. We're here to help. And um, with that, I will turn things over to Melissa for essays. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sue. And thanks again to everyone for joining us today. So in the essay section, there are two pieces that I'm going to focus on here. First being the essay itself, but then I'm also going to give a bit of thought to the optional essay, which is in the same section of the application. So you see here on the side essay, that's where our required essay will be, but there's also a space for our optional essay, which you can choose to fill out or not. We'll talk about that a little later. Uh, and the reason that I'm going to talk about both of these components is that a lot of the pre-submitted questions that you all sent in had you know, some questions that overlapped with the optional essay. And so I wanna give an eye to both as we dive into that just a bit more here. So starting with our required essay question, we're asking what are your short and long-term career interests? Please describe what drives these interests and how they connect to your academic, professional, or personal experiences. So for those of you who joined the demystifying the application session that we held last week, or also if you take a look at the instructions page of our application, you'll know that one of the major components that we're considering in a candidate's application is a desire to make an impact in the asset management industry, both during the program, but also in your career following. Uh, this program is distinctive among master's degrees in finance due to its unique focus on the theory and practice of asset management. So this essay is a high impact space for us on the admissions committee, because we want to make sure that your career goals align with, the, with what this program has to offer. Uh, and we wanna make sure that you're envisioning, you know, a career in asset management that we believe the program can best assist you with. So 
Moving into my advice for the essay, starting with a couple of pro tips. First, it may sound very simple, but remember to answer the question. And what do I mean by that? So we know that everyone here who is applying to the master's in asset management program is likely applying to multiple other programs as well. And that is absolutely fine. I encourage you to research a bunch of different programs and find the ones that best match you and what you think they'll take you uh, to with your career. So please do you know, be putting all of your feelers out there and considering multiple programs. But in the process of doing that, putting together multiple applications, it can be very tempting to take a base essay and try to fit that into multiple questions that you see in different applications. And maybe in the process, you tailor just a couple of sentences or two that you think kind of answer the question that we're asking. And I'll just say that there are downsides to doing that because you may not actually answer the question that we're asking. And with this being such a high impact space where we in admissions are looking to know whether or not asset management is the industry that you've considered and want to pursue, if you don't directly answer the question, this can leave us personally with more questions than answers about your application. So just remember to try to answer the question as best as possible. And also with this, remember that in the process of using a base essay for multiple programs, that you should always double and triple check that you've updated the program title and school that you're applying to. I know that that sounds a little silly, but we truly see this every single year. And you do not want to be the person telling us that you're very dedicated to a program that is not the one we're reading for. Um, secondly, and probably most importantly of these pro tips that I'll offer here today, um, I just wanna ask that you be intentional and reflective in the process of writing your essay. And you'll notice here that I'm not using the terminology be specific, and that in itself is quite intentional on my part. When it comes to an essay that asks you to think about your future, we completely understand that you may not have everything figured out. And honestly, for anyone who does end up applying and enrolling in the master's in asset management program, more often than not, these candidates end up on maybe a slightly different path than what they described in their essay, or honestly, an entirely different path than what they may have stated in their essay. And that makes all the sense in the world. This program is going to show you all sides of the asset management industry. So the likelihood that you find a different topic within asset management that then becomes what you're most interested in pursuing long term, that's entirely understandable and honestly encouraged. So as you're writing your application, don't feel as though you have to know what you're going to pursue in the future, but be intentional and be reflective as to how your past has brought you to the asset management industry and how this informs what you're considering pursuing in the future. And then finally, on the pro tips, once again, it might seem very simple, but please do revise and edit and then ask someone to take a look for you and revise again once they've done that. Um, very important, all the same, even if it does sound like simple advice. All right, now getting into your questions, the majority of the questions submitted in your registration forms did have to do with the essay. So I'm gonna spend you know a bit of time here uh, before we move into our breakout rooms. Um, most of the questions that you all submitted followed a similar trend where you were asking what you should and should not mention in your essay. So the two questions that I have here as the most frequently asked go hand in hand. And that brings us to the optional essay as well as the required essay in this section of the application. So for the optional essay, most people do not need to complete this section. Um, I'll just say that 
you know, it's very important not to use this as an opportunity to tell the committee about something that we haven't asked for in any space of the application. So like Sue said, we spent a lot of time creating this application and being intentional with the questions that we ask, because those lead to the pieces of information that we think will best help us make a decision. So if there isn't a question listed in the application, just know that that is for a reason. And, you know, starting with the second question here, uh, one of the questions that we hear a lot, and this was in your registration forms as well, is should I expand on my candidacy? Should I tell you why I'm a good candidate in the optional essay? And uh, the entirety of your application without you having to go into details in an optional essay already gives us the answer to that question. So just keep in mind as your time, you know, spending time in this section that you don't need to provide any additional context for things that we haven't asked for. And for the optional essay, instead, you need to provide some additional context around something that is already a part of your application, such as a reason for choosing an unconventional recommender. Maybe you have kind of an unusual timeline for your academics or your professional experience, and you want to best use this section to help us kind of connect the dots for things that aren't as clear. And then also something that we've added this year because we've seen this a lot in previous cycles, is if you've taken a class that kind of has an ambiguous title uh, and you want us to give additional context as to what topics were covered in that class, feel free to do that here in the optional essay. Um, in the questions submitted, there were a lot of questions about, you know, should I talk about this quant class um, in my required main essay? And I want to point you to the optional essay for things such as that. And moving back to our first frequently asked question, uh, this is popular because you just have 500 words. How do you fit X, Y, Z, this, that, and the other thing all into this 500 word space? Uh, so my advice here is to think about this question in two parts. So we're asking you to be backward looking and then forward looking. And I would literally start with this essay question by making a list for those two categories. So starting with what was my initial inspiration point towards pursuing asset management? And then what classes, what internships, what experiences have brought me to where I am today, where I'm sure that asset management is a career that I want to pursue. And honestly, in your essays, it very much can read as a listicle of what's brought you to this moment. Just remember that your writing does not have to be perfect, flawless, have these beautiful connecting paragraphs from one section to the other about what's brought you to now. That's gonna take up so much space. That's gonna take up your 500 words. And because this is such prime real estate for you telling us how you've gotten to this point, just remember that you don't have to, you know, be as beautiful. You can put out a list and that clear picture of why you're applying today and giving us, you know, a strong narrative for why you're considering the program is so much more important than having it be just a gorgeous, flawless essay for why asset management is the industry for you. And same with the future. Uh, remember that you don't have to be super specific about what you want to pursue, but try to connect the dots for us. Uh, how have your past experiences led you to your future consideration? And remember that also, you know, while you don't have to be specific about what you want to pursue, this is a great time to exemplify your industry knowledge and give us a sense of how this program will help you with an overarching career goal. So, let us know, you know, I'm not entirely sure if I'm interested in fundamental versus quantitative approach, um, but I've done my research on asset management and this is what I'm considering for now. So if you're able to give us, you know, some more insight into the fields and functions within asset management that you're interested in, like I said, you don't have to be specific, but using that terminology is really helpful for us because it shows that you've done your research and that you know that this is the career for you. All right. And then finally, like I said, 500 words, it's really hard to fit everything that you want to talk about into that space. Actually, depending on you know who you are as a person, maybe 500 words is daunting as a goal to try to reach. Uh, but just remember that 
500 words is an intentional limitation on our part. So please do try to stick to that. And remember that we believe that this is enough space for you to answer the question. So don't feel like it has to be flawless, but connect those dots and make your story very clear for us, just like you have to do with your recommendations. Um, and that's that's all the advice I have to offer on the essay front. And I'll throw it back to Sue to talk about next steps. What are we doing now? Thank you, Melissa. Um, I just added this fun photo of our class of 2024 here cheering you on as you're putting together your application. Um, but before we go into breakout rooms, I just want to put the email address I was speaking about earlier. So if you do run into anything throughout the application process, again, we're always here. Um, that inbox is monitored frequently. It's asset MGMT like the band, if anyone's familiar, dot admissions at yale.edu. Um, and now we will go ahead and go into breakout rooms. So 